All right, folks, another day, another dead farm truck on the hook. It's a Ford this time, 1997 Ford F-350. It's got the 7.3 liter power stroke diesel engine. It hasn't run for at least two years. It hasn't been on the road for at least four years. She's a little punky in all the usual places. Not surprising. It's like some of that's off this truck. Oh, another DPF filter fell off. Funny how they keep doing that. Anyway, the story I heard is that the brake line went out. So they stopped driving it on the road. And then they were just plowing with it. It's got a snow plow for the front. Just plowing with it around the yard. Come on, Ford Hood. Don't be like that. And then, I don't know if you'll be able to see it, the AC clutch went out of it and it threw the belt off and they stopped running it at all. It's been sitting outside uncovered for that whole time. Looks like the raccoons have been busy. squirrels or some other kind of rodent, I don't know. Anyway, they want to get it running and if possible, get it back on the road. Seems kind of crazy to put one of these, you know, 25 year old rust buckets back on the road, but people have funny ideas. As expected, the batteries are spanked. I cooked them for over an hour and it won't even power on the IDM, so. Hold your breath. All right, we'll yank that guy out of there. We'll put in a dummy battery for now. I just wanna see if it'll even crank over, make sure the engine's not locked up. Cause it looks like the critters have been in the intake. Yeah, also, I noticed, once we moved it up here onto the approach to the shop, she's leaking out of the rear diff cover, so that's rusted through. Pretty typical. Let's see, how are the spring hanger brackets? Already been replaced. That's good, that's a pretty common vulnerability with these trucks done a couple of videos about that yeah typical crustiness looks like we got an inspection hole there in the fender well not much left of the box cross members filler neck looks solid though yeah oh, it's got a plastic fuel tank what when did they start doing that? My 95 has steel tanks. It's got two tanks, doesn't it? Is the other one plastic too? No, steel. And it's rusted through. Okay, that answers that. It's probably an aftermarket tank. It's like a new fuel line too. So there's about a 10% chance this hold down bolt comes out without breaking off. Oh. I think it's an M5 thread. Usually they're already broken off during the free battery installation. Lucky there. Nope, I don't think I want to touch it. Now there should be a carrying strap for this battery. It's broken. So what are you gonna do? You know, grab it with your hands like a caveman? I don't think so. You need an obscure specialty tool. A battery lifter. Hold your breath again. This 
this battery is way too small and the terminals are on the wrong side, but it should be good enough to give us a pass fail on this engine. Maybe, if we can reach. Not gonna reach. Yeah, we'll just do it this way. Yep, it works. Oh, where's the ground? Where'd you go, little buddy? There you are. Let's try that. Let's try this again. Try the sacrificial screwdriver. Just see what she does. Come on. Oh yeah. A little bit of glow plug. I see what's smoking, it's whatever that wire is. Seems important, I guess we better tighten that up. What's she do now? Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. I don't care what anybody says. These 7.3 power strokes are hard to kill. Cool. Well, we need a starter solenoid, a fan belt, an AC clutch, differential cover, and a brake line. Two new batteries. We might be able to drive this thing. Maybe a little bit of a scrub. All right, folks, we've got the green light. Priority one is to get this thing inside the shop. It's way, way too hot to be working out here in the parking lot. We're gonna throw in a couple new batteries and a new starter relay. And then it should start and run and drive under its own power. We'll limp it inside the shop. And then we've got the rest of the goodies. There's an accumulator, new belt, diff cover and gasket, and there's an AC compressor down there somewhere. We'll fix the brake line and I'm sure we're going to find plenty of other problems once we get underneath of it. Jeepers. It's almost like somebody melted that terminal with a screwdriver. Kind of a weird thing to happen, don't you think? Well, this relay has four pins, but we're only going to use three. It should ground through the, the case. I don't know, can you put AC Delco batteries in a Ford? Maybe we should stand back.
Seems okay. at all. I'm not even trying to do anything. Okay. But the transmission seems to work, so that's good. Whoa, baby, whoa. <laughs> okay. Park it for now, we'll clear out a spot and get it in the shop. Why are we working outside again? Can't remember. Anyway, we've got a problem we need to sort out before we get too carried away here. The engine will start and run, but it has a long crank time, way longer than normal. Usually that's a problem with the Huey system. So these power strokes use high pressure oil to fire the injectors. And if they can't make the pressure that they need, they won't fire the injectors and the engine won't start. Most common causes of that are a leak that either bleeds off oil or allows air into the Huey system and the air is not is compressible so you won't you get a long crank time it'll eventually start and run or we could have a problem with the IPR valve the injection pressure regulator it's not closing enough and not causing the pressure to ramp up high enough fast enough anyway these seven threes are terrible when you get air in the the high pressure oil system takes a long time to bleed it out so I threw on this dummy pulley here took off the AC compressor this is off of my truck anyway I now I can run the engine for as long as I want so I, I ran it yesterday for about 45 minutes and it still has the same extended crank problem it seems to, to restart okay when it's hot which makes me think that it's not the injector o-rings but if you let it sit for I don't know, even five minutes it has a long crank time. I'll show you guys. See how much glare I can get on the screen. Yeah, a lot. So the top line is our IPR command and then the ICP pressure, which is the injector control pressure. So let's see what happens here when we crank it. Oh, come on. Should have known that was going to happen. Now you see it's commanding the IPR, but we're not getting anything on the pressure. So if I hold it long enough, it'll start. There you go. Hear the exhaust back pressure flap close. So it's working normally. So I think from that data we can say that the, the computer is controlling the IPR valve correctly. Ugh. Stupid Fords. Why doesn't that stay on? Sorry guys, it's my first day. Uh, the IPR valve is being commanded normally and the ICP pressure, the ICP sensors, the injection control pressure sensors seem to be working correctly. They're giving feedback to the computer. It's just we have too much of a delay between when it commands the IPR and when it sees the ICP pressure. So that's the problem. At this point, I suspect it's got a bad IPR valve. I think we'll go ahead and get that out of there and see. Maybe we have a torn, torn O-ring or something. But that's where we're going to start. There's the IPR valve. O-rings look good. I don't see any obvious problems. Here's the rest of the pieces of it. Pretty straightforward to get those out. I found this inch and an eighth socket at AutoZone. It's a Duralast 12 point and it fits right over this IPR valve and the, the end of it will actually fit down inside the square anyway it works better than the six point socket that I was using previously 
The only thing that kind of jumps out at me, there should be a seal, a grommet inside here for the, the connector, and it's all melted, and it looks pretty terrible inside there. But I checked the resistance across the coil, it seems to be, well it matches another one that I had, this is another IPR valve I took off a of DT-466. <sighs> you guys remember a year ago when there was no traffic on the roads? That was so nice. Anyway, I think what we'll do, we'll go ahead and put the new IPR valve in. And if it fixes the problem, great, you know, we're one step ahead. If it doesn't fix the problem, I'll put the old one back in and we'll, we'll carry on with our troubleshooting. And I'll just put this one on the shelf, because I do run into these, these bad IPR valves pretty regularly. So the other option, or the other thing we could do, is I have one of these, somewhere around here I have an old IPR valve that I welded the holes up. And I welded a, an air fitting to the end of it so we can pressurize the HPOP system. And we can do two things with that. We can deadhead the system by putting it in a plug, or by capping it off basically, or by feeding air to it, we can see if we have a leak somewhere in the high pressure system, but just, like I said, shooting from the hip doesn't feel like a leak, it feels like a bad IPR valve. All right folks, I figured we should follow up on the melted weather pack here inside this terminal. That's what it's supposed to look like. And there's nothing but a gooey mess in there. And that led me to an interesting discovery. There's the pigtail for the IPR valve. And, uh, yeah, that's not good. It's not good at all. Somehow they've shorted together and melted all the insulation off. I don't know how this thing ran. I really don't. That had to be a dead short. Also, I'm not sure what caused the problem. I don't think we can blame our little snack-stealing friends we have left deposits all over this engine because the loom wrap was still in good shape covering up that the wires in that harness well yeah that's pretty weird I've I've replaced these pigtails before but I've never seen one mangled this bad that's crazy anyway not a big deal there's a new pigtail for it it's also the same pigtail for the I believe it's for the turbo, the VVT turbo, maybe that's on the 6 liter, the VVT solenoid. Anyway, Ford used this on a, in a few other places. So they are available. And then I think, since we've had so much meltage inside this coil, I've got a coil here off of another IPR valve that I warrantied out. I'm pretty sure electronically it was still working, it was just mechanically failed, so we're probably going to swap it out for this guy. But the actual IPR valve, it's probably okay. Just an electronic problem. So let me splice in the new pigtail. We'll reinstall the old IPR valve. I found a few other problems. The ICP sensor here is leaking oil through the sensor. So that really needs to be replaced. And then this guy here, something's been chewing on those wires. I'll try to show you guys the IPR valve installation process. It'll be tricky because there's a lot of things competing for a limited amount of space. Alright, got it started. That's the hardest part. Without getting a bunch of bunch of schmutz on it. Okay. There's the socket. Alright, I think we got it. Alright. plug things back in. Like I said, lots of little bite marks on these wires. 
It really needs a whole, a whole engine sub harness. But we're probably not going to find one of those. There we go. And we'll refill the high pressure oil reservoir. You don't have to fill it all the way up. You just put enough in there to prime the, kind of get the system primed until it builds base oil pressure. Then you can just dump the rest of the oil back in the, the oil fill hole. Of course it would be better to put fresh oil in here, but I captured this oil in a clean container, so not too worried about it. truck's been sitting overnight. I let it run for, I don't know, 45 minutes or so yesterday. But I have a feeling it's not going to be any better. Let's see what happens here. All right, we're doing a pressure test of the Huey system. I've had 100 PSI air pressure on this now for couple of minutes I don't hear anything we're not losing any pressure so I would say we do not have a leak in the high-pressure oil system or at least we don't have a leak that will show up with this low of pressure it's still possible that there's a leak that only shows up under high pressure but I think it's unlikely I don't know what's going on I did notice Something interesting. See that wire there that's broken? Don't know what that's about. We should probably fix that too. All right guys, I'm not sure what's going on. I did install the new IPR valve that we bought. It doesn't seem like it's really any better. Let it idle last night for about 45 minutes. I just wonder if maybe it still has air in it because we can't take it out and drive it. So at this point, I'm confident that it, well, I'm reasonably confident that it doesn't have a bad injector O-ring. We're not going to have to pull the valve covers. I think we'll proceed with our repairs. We'll get the brake line fixed. We'll get the diff cover replaced. Then we can take it out and really beat on it and see if we can get that air out of it. Let's show you what it does. That's just way too long. Well, this rig's pretty jacked up, both literally and figuratively. I ended up having to pop that step loose and fold it up so it would clear the lift arms. Let's take a gander underneath. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. She's a little rusty. Pretty healthy lift kit there. Yeah. So it looks like, looks to me like the lines, the brake lines going out to the wheel cylinders have already been replaced. They're pretty rusty, but Somebody's done those once before. You can see our diff cover there, rusted right through. I think where we're gonna find problems with our brake line is gonna be up here. Where it comes out of that flex hose and makes the turn, looks like she's busted right there. So we'll probably just replace it all the way from the from the flex hose along the frame rail all the way up here to the ABS valve. Oh hey, looks like Scotty Kilmer already had a go at it. So we'll get rid of the compression fittings. 
hopefully that curly Q there going up to the master cylinder is okay. We may have to replace that too. Probably needs all the brake lines. The front ones don't look too healthy either. See this one where it goes underneath the engine that always takes a beating. I think somebody might have replaced that one already though. Judging by the way it's not clipped in anywhere. Okay, well we can work with this. Looks like the ticket. This is a common enough problem in our area that my local auto parts store had this on the shelf. Oh, by the way, a viewer, I believe his name was Steve, sent me this new DeWalt 12 volt impact. I guess he must have been tired of me whining about the old one. Well, thank you very much, Steve. It works great. too bad really. There's that same tone ring that we replaced in a F350 once before. Remember that video? That was a pretty fun diagnosis. Cover, new gasket. Stick it together here. Man down. There we go. We're going to fill it up with 75 140. And I did crack the drain or the fill plug loose before I took the cover off. Get a lot of comments about that. And I don't know why. I mean, it's got to come out one way or another. So if it's stuck in there, we're going to have to deal with it. I mean, what are you going to do if the, if the fill plug won't come out? Are you just going to not fix the rusted out cover? These original fuel lines? I guess I never paid attention. I didn't think they were originally stainless steel. Alright, I threaded in a new piece of NICOP. The tape's just there to keep the nut from sliding down the brake line while I push it through the frame rail. And we'll use an actual line wrench. Yes, I do own them. I just find them to be very overrated. Kind of like ratcheting wrenches. There we go. Now the nice thing about this NICOP is it doesn't look pretty right now, but we can just tweak it and bend it however we see fit. The old line out of the holder and we'll jam the night cop in that's it I'm gonna leave the old brake line in there like a total hack because this is just a crusty old farm truck and nobody cares
Well, now I stepped in it. That brake bleeder came loose, no problem. This one over here on the right side, I touched it and it just snapped it right off. So there's still a bit of it sticking out. I'm gonna to try to weld a nut on there and we'll see if we can get it that way. There we go. It's ugly, but it did the trick. How's anybody live without a welder and an air hammer? Boggles the mind. All right, new brake bleeder installed. An underpaid brake bleeder ascending. Uh-oh, uh-oh, hold on. I literally... Do not stand at or above this level. Oh. <laughs> Well, maybe you shouldn't put the lift so high. I feel like we have this conversation all the time. I offered to lower it and he said no. Do you really think it matters if I hit the lift with the door? On this truck? No. Okay. Slam, slam it if you want. <laughs> Don't step on that aluminum step though. It's not really a step. Oh, something just, I just kicked something off of the It's a lift. bolt for the step. Okay. I'm not even sure if I'm gonna, okay. All right. All right, pump, pump away. It's not gonna get better. Okay, hold up a minute. All right, push the pedal down. All right, lady, thank you very much. Tell us what strenuous activity you're gonna be doing this afternoon. Going to the pool. <laughs> well, 
What a rough life these teachers have in the summer. I don't know what you're talking about. All right, thanks. It's after work time. What time is it? 3.30. After work time for teachers. And bankers. Well, I made it about that far. Looks like the other brake line that goes from the ABS valve up to the master cylinder is now blown out. The one that I said I hope doesn't blow out. Yeah, shouldn't be too bad, I guess. Well, somehow I ended up one coil short, but it's close enough, I think. All right, let's try this again. I should have known better. I should have just replaced that one to start with. Anyway, I think all of them have now been replaced at one point in time. So we should be good to go. My brake bleeding service has the afternoon off. So I just cracked the fitting loose down here at the ABS valve and let it gravity bleed. If that's not good enough, we'll have to re-bleed the brakes later. But it's good enough for now. All right, folks, it's the following day. I took the truck for a drive last night. It runs good and it drives sort of okay-ish. The front end is completely pooched. All the ball joints are shot. The U-joints are shot. The tie rod ends are shot. It needs the whole front axle, the whole front end rebuilt. But, you know, 212,000 miles. It's had a plow on it the whole time. I guess that's not too surprising. The engine, it's kicking my butt. It really is. I made a discovery, and I've never seen anything quite like this before. I'll show you what happens. Well, the truck's been sitting, I don't know, half an hour. Key off. I'm going to turn the key on. We're going to fire up the scan tool. And I'll show you, it's going to have an extremely long crank time. Here we go. Alright, I turned the truck off, but I turned the key right back on. So the ignition is on right now. We're looking at the scan tool. So it's cranking at 134 RPM. And the voltage at the... Come on, Claire. Voltage at the ECM is 10.1 volts. That should be fine. Anything above 10 should be okay. But you see there's a long time here. You see this kind of plateau? where it's commanding the IPR valve at 55%, which is basically fully closed, and the ICP pressure is not coming up. So I don't, I don't know why. But here's what I discovered. If I run the engine, and then I shut it off and turn the key right back on, like within five seconds I turn the key back on, I can let it sit for as long as I want. Like I can let this thing sit for half an hour. So long as the key is on, it'll start right back up. So I'll bring you guys back. See right now the scan tool says it's 10, 19, or 8, 19 a.m. It's actually closer to 11 o'clock. I'll bring you back in 10 minutes and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Are you not videotaping me? What are you doing back there? <laughs> if that is in footage, I will kill you. Oh, okay. All right, folks. It's been sitting for, what, over 10 minutes. Let's try Let's try this again. I can figure out how to how to make it work again. So the key's been on, not running, of course. And it starts right up. So what's different? I just I don't get it. The voltage is a little bit higher, 10.8 instead of 10.1. The IPR percentage command, it's about the same. Engine RPM, 143 versus 133. I mean, is that really enough to make a difference? I just, I don't get it. All right, the scope's coming out. Things are getting serious. I've got one lead on the cam position sensor, one on the IPR and one on the ICP. We're just gonna see what it actually does. I'm kind of wondering, well, I, I'm kind of curious if maybe that, those shorted wires damaged the driver in the PCM for the IPR valve. And even though the scan tool is telling us that it's working, it's not really working. And somehow leaving the key on helps. I don't know, it doesn't make much sense. Anyway, firing up the Pico. 
Check out my new uh, diagnostic cart here. We're trying it out. I got tired of always rooting through drawers to get the leads and scope and all that jazz. So hoping this is a little bit more rough and ready solution. Well folks, I just don't know. I really don't. I've got two captures here. This is the short crank time. This is where if you leave the key on, it starts, in my opinion, normally. And then this one here is the long crank time where the key is off. As far as I can tell, everything is here that it needs to start and run. So the green line here is the ICP, that's the pressure of the oil. You see it ramping up here. This yellow or orange trace here, that's the starter current. So right here where it spikes, that's where it's where I'm turning the key to start. The blue is the camshaft position sensor. So you see it turns over about one revolution before it starts to really ramp up the red, which is the IPR valve. I'm measuring the amperage of the IPR valve. I switched that around. So it makes about, I don't know, half a turn, one turn, whatever, until it gets this skinny trace on the, or this narrower section of the, the trigger wheel. It ramps up the IPR valve. It keeps ramping it up, and then you see it makes like, I don't know, one full revolution of the camshaft, so that'd be two revolutions of the crankshaft before it even starts to build any ICP pressure. Now, if you look at the other one, the short crank time, it's about the same. The engine must have stopped in a different spot. Anyway, it takes a little bit less time for it to start ramping up the amperage on the IPR valve. But it's essentially building ICP pressure from the second that you start cranking it until it takes over and runs. And I don't know what the difference is. The cam position signal is good on both. The values for the amperage and voltage are the same on both. Everything's the same. I don't understand why it starts twice as fast if you leave the key on. I just don't. I don't have an explanation for that. I mean, is there something that leaks down when the key is off that doesn't leak down when the key is on? I can't think of anything. The injectors, there's no control over the injectors without the IDM, the injector driver module running, and it won't run without a cam position sig signal, so there's nothing happening with that when the key is just on and the engine's not running. I don't know. I can't think of a variable that could explain this. I think we're going to have to just let it go. I've invested way, way, way too much time trying to figure this out because it's something you don't see every day. I wanted to, you know, it interests me, but it doesn't pay the bills. So at this point, I'm going to say it's as good as we're going to get it. I did install the new IPR valve. It seems to be better with that. I don't trust the old one because of those melted wires. So we're going to run with that. Yeah, that's all I can say. I really don't know. Well, I hooked up the AC machine. It pulled out zero refrigerant, so don't need to worry about that. I did notice, however, when I was playing around that the blower motor sounds, well, let's just say it's got a little bit of an imbalance. So we're going to pop it loose here. I've got a feeling we're going to find some critters. And we are not disappointed. Yeah, you love mice. This heater box is an absolute horror show. There's been enough generations of rodents living in here. It may have been home to an undiscovered species. There's the evaporator core. It's caked in rodent feces. I'd be real surprised if that thing holds any kind of pressure. 
We'll give it a try, but certainly no guarantees. You see the, the critters have chewed a hole right there where the blower, the squirrel cage fits. So that's not ideal. The only good thing is the fresh air door was closed and the blend door was closed. So they were kind of isolated to this side of the heater box. I don't think they were able to get into the actual heater core. Of course, they probably chewed through, chewed through both of those somewhere that I can't see. Anyway, what a mess. See that vacuum line's been chewed through. There's another one over here on the reservoir that's been chewed through. And there's just, yeah, nest and feces and just absolute disgustingness. So yeah, pretty normal day really. I did replace the chewed up vacuum lines here and over here. That's the reservoir down there on the side of the heater box. I also spliced that wire back together going into the ECM. I believe that's for the transmission. I imagine there's plenty of other rodent wiring damage scattered throughout this truck, but that's the only obvious ones that I see. Hello, Pooch. Dad. Hey, you guys can film an outro for me. All right, do you know what we did to this? this pile of junk slash did truck. did not set it on fire. It was tempting. Very tempting. All right, folks, we're going to have to leave it at that. It runs fine. It starts okay. Possibly if he drives it some more, it'll snap out of that. I really don't know. I am going to leave the new IPR valve in. I don't trust the coil on that old one since the pigtail was melted. I just... Yeah, I don't, I don't trust it. Anyway, I got the AC all tuned up. It's working. Uh, the accumulator, I tried to install this China Special accumulator last night and it galled up all the threads here and broke the fitting right off the side of it. So I spent, I don't know, 20 minutes or so picking aluminum out of the steel nut and then I just reinstalled the old accumulator. I've got a feeling it's going to be back here before too long anyway. So I'd be real surprised if that condenser or evaporator holds holds pressure for long with all the rodent infestation. Well, I suppose we ought to take this beast for a ride. License plates are well, four years expired. I'm sure it has no insurance. But uh, yeah, let's not let that stop us. Come on, Pop. It's getting better. Come on, Pop. Let's go for a ride. I'll be jiggered. I think it's working. All right, well, scooch over. Man, the smell is undescribable. Ugh. Imagine a vehicle that was parked in front of a hog confinement for four years and infested by mice and rats. Ugh, it's just, you can't even describe it. All right, here we go. The, uh, the shifter is, let's just say it's pretty vague. She's got a, a well slop pretty typical for a plow truck. It's probably been shifted from reverse to drive about a zillion times. Here we go. A lot of cops out this weekend, so we'll stick to the, the gravel roads. What do you think, pup? Didn't drive too bad. Like I said, the front end is completely shot. a 
wicked case of Ford door. But the AC works, all the gauges work. I don't know, something's a little funny with the transmission. Yeah, hear that? It almost wants to die when you go to reverse. That's not right. It's like it's trying to lock the torque converter or something. Power steering pump's pretty noisy, but then again, it's a Ford. It's missing the wrap on the steering wheel. Another typical Ford problem. It's got an ABS light on. That wasn't on yesterday. I don't know what's up with that. Or whatever day it was I drove it. Let's see if the ABS works. Nope. Definitely not. Well, that's fine. What do you think, Pop? I think it checks out. Alright folks, that's it. Another clapped out old Ford coming at you in the opposite lane. I don't, I won't let him in the toilet. My son told me there was a toad in the potty. I didn't believe him. Turns out he was right. Alright, should we go let him go? No, I want, I want to wait for him to jump. Well, let's go set him on the ground and see if he'll jump. Well, let's just see what he does. What's he gonna do? I think he's gonna hang out for a little bit until he figures out what's going on. Hey, I hope this corn is knee high by the 4th of July. Can I just let him free? Yeah, we did let him free. We'll just leave him there. He can do his toad thing. We'll come back in a little bit and see if he jumped out. Alright, little toad. We're Good free. Luck. Um, we're free and in the wild. Yep. Yeah, we've been watching too much wild crats, haven't we, buddy?